All right, Steve, I wanted to, um, to start off with you. Uh, and and uh, So when you present the news uh, with, with data-centered visuals, how have you found that, um, that the audience has reacted to this type of storytelling? So one thing I'd say about that um, is that visuals don't uh, equal automatic audience engagement and traffic. You know, there's not, visuals aren't kind of magic formula where you sort of jam a bunch of visuals into your report and, and the audience is gonna come along with you. Uh, and uh, I think this is especially true when it comes to data visualization. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a, a kind of lesson that the, the graphics department at the New York Times, it sort of took us a little while to, to learn this. It seems obvious in hindsight, but um, you know, it was about 10 years ago that we were really starting to get engaged with serious data visualization. Um, is it, you know, a couple of years before, um, Amanda Cox uh, joined the staff and she had a background in statistics and the desk was becoming a little more um, just fluent with tools that allowed us to, to be able to manage larger data sets. And so we were, we were excited about that. You know, we, we wanted to uh, show what we could do and, you know, uh, so we were developing different kinds of data visualization and there were other news organizations were, that were starting to do it as well and um, I, I would sort of refer to this era as like the hairball era because we, we, we were producing, you know, sort of fuzzy uh, kind of hairball-like graphics. Uh, not, not, we weren't the only ones doing this. was sort of um, emerging from other organizations uh, and we were sort of, you know, shoving these in front of readers and maybe giving them a couple like pull down menus and asking them to sort of filter and sort of engage with this data and just kind of giving it to them and saying, you know, here you go. Um, assuming that our excitement about like working with data was, was just going to sort of automatically um, bring the audience along. And, you know, the audience, <clears throat> they, they're, you know, depending on the project, they were, they were interested, but they, I think rightfully there was, you know, some reluctance and, and the, the indication was that we should we should do our jobs as editors and make stories out of uh, data, tell stories with data. Um, and, you know, that, that was kind of like a, a critical, uh, you know, thing that we, we had to work through. And I don't know if we're showing any of these slides. There's, there's one piece that, um, Oh yeah, so these are stills from a piece that is about eight years old now, actually, but I, I, I included it because it's kind of a milestone, uh, you know, in this education where it, it was, a, it was a, uh, I think, a fine story that we told with data. You know, in this case, we had a couple thousand data points, all of Mariano Rivera's pitches for, you know, one season. He was the, you know, he's retired now, he was the closer for the Yankees. And so you can see a couple of things. I mean, it was, it was a video. Um, and, you know, we, we, we had the data and, and we could have kind of displayed it all at once and done the thing that I was talking about, which is, yeah. you know, just, let, just give readers access to it, which was, you know, there was, there was some uh, pressure to do that at that time. Um, but we decided to make it into a linear explanation to, you know, like very deliberately show readers, this is what's interesting in this yeah. data. And, and some of the interesting things were that you know, across all of these pitches, you can see, you know, in some of the, in some of the places where it's, you get some red shading, he doesn't, he doesn't throw much over the center of the plate, and in one where you see all of the balls coming at you at once was about how difficult it is for batters to kind of decide whether or not to swing in a pitch, because pitches that seem, you know, the same when you have to decide to swing, they end up in all these different places. Um, and. You know, that's something that we have now, we do routinely. Uh, Amanda, who I mentioned, is now the editor of The Upshot, and they make all kinds of stories with data. The graphics department makes, makes stories with data. Um, and the audience, you know, it's not just those two groups, you know, this exists across the newsroom, but um, the audience has kind of engaged with that. You know, we're, we're, we're seeing them, uh, you know, um, showing interest in those kinds of stories. So you find when you, are editing a data-centered story, just like any other story, when it has more focus, that's when you see, or when you're, you're guiding folks through the, this sort of information. Yeah, I mean, and it should, I mean, like I said, that, that should be an obvious point. I mean, right. we, 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 there's, you know, uh, long history of editing stories, stories being successful because they're properly edited, right. uh, because they have news, they have narrative power, you know, things that make a great story, but I, I think, 
Um, there was a time when uh, we sort of made an assumption that that data in and of itself, visualized in some way, put in yeah. front of readers, would be compelling, right. and the, that wasn't really true. Build it and they will come. That's right, right. right. But I, I think, I think the, the core of what you're getting at is like insights, not data, right? Like I think our, our job primarily is like, nobody wants to pour over like 700 spreadsheets to like find out what's interesting, right? Like right. our job is to do that and then tell people right. like, here's what's important, here's what you right. should actually care about. Uh, which is, you know, the example you're showing is, that, you know, that's the, the insight, right? Like, he mm -hmm. pitches a certain way, and he's special because of that. And you right. can show that's that right. thing yeah. visually, right? Yes, you that's right. People through visual. You couldn't do that with text, right? right. Like, you know, right. you know, it took you, like, what, two sentences to describe how he pitches, or you have a picture. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, I, w I wanted to show something we did at the Tribune. This is another thing that where we do a big... Uh, a big investigation on how unfair the property tax system is in Cook County, and we had, there were many findings, and it actually, you know, uh, Joe Berrios was voted out of office in the primary a few weeks ago. But one of the interesting things about the data that came along with this is we can say in a news story sentence, hey, this system is really unfair, and it's rigged against poor people in Cook County, but because we had bunches of data, we can allow user, users on the story to look up how unfair it was in their part of the city, right? Like you, ty you can type your address in and see how the story applies to you. And we found that when we do graphics where the user, where the person reading it can see themselves in that story, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we found success there. We found that people are really interested in yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. a, that is true, that, that, that data is, um, it, you know, obviously it can be personalized yeah. um, and that's powerful, but there's a, there's a sort of broader um, power that visuals have um, in terms of in, in engaging an audience um, that, that the Times is still learning, you know, including visuals in stories routinely, you know, uh, writing directly mm -hmm. to them, you know, uh, uh, which means changing the copy to actually right. directly address uh, mm -hmm. visuals. And, and there's a greater fluency, you know, within the Times and, and across other news organizations uh, doing this, and it, and it is uh, you know, created, I think, um, a better kind of explanatory storytelling yeah. and, and actually opened the door a little bit um, for a different voice mm -hmm. with, with these kinds of stories where, where the language is very direct and conversational mm -hmm. and so the explanation comes across right. very clearly as if, as if you were explaining to a person right then and there. Right, right. Les, I want to ask you a question. Um, All right. At Axios, the, the traditional definition of what a news story is is, is different from a lot of legacy yes. organizations. Um, how has uh, how's data in the web changed what a story is today? Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's 2018. I think if you go back, like, five or six years, like, having data people on your staff was, like, a luxury, right? And it was like, oh, my God, they're doing something with data. Now I think it's, like, pretty commonplace, right? Almost every yeah. you know, news organization has uh, data at the forefront. Um, for those of you who don't know Axios, go to signup.axios.com and get all the <laughs> newsletters. Um, my boss maybe say that. Um, but I guess the, the, the core of Axios is that, you know, you know, readers do not want to read like an 800 word story with like the news at the top and then a bunch of B matter, right? Like we just focus on like what is new and why it matters, right? Yeah. Um, I think visuals are uniquely suited to that because they, you know, provide a lot of information in a very, very small amount of space. Like that's ultimately what, what we want to do. We want to be very efficient. At, um, at presenting information. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the news is a statistic, right? The news is a new poll. The news is a different way of looking um, at, you know, at the news um, you know, through data or through existing um, information. Or sometimes, like the thing that's up there, it's just me having a lot of time and a little bit of fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, uh, what you see up there is a uh, modified, uh, it's a modified version of something called a turnoff face. Uh, a turnoff face was invented by, I think, Herman Chernoff, like sometime in the 70s, 74 maybe, where he would map different multivariate va uh, values of a single thing into a face, right? So big eyes might mean something, small eyes might mean something, big ears, small ears, a frown, a smile. And I was like, hey, I'm going to do this for no reason. Um, and I said, okay, well, what if I take state-level data and I make emojis because it's 2017? Um, and that's what came up with that, right? So I think in that, the color is the uninsured rate. Um, I think the, uh, like the, the eye size or the bags under the eyes are like percentage of adults who get enough sleep. Um, 
Fun, fun fact, uh, there was a uh, research paper written about multivariate uh, data designs, and um, the guy hates turnoff face, but he hates this one the least. <laughs> uh, and I think it was because the, th you know, the, the parts of the face were, were yeah. like, contextually related to like, what the data is showing. And this is a way to like, personalize the data, right? Like, right. A, 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 maybe a less kooky example of this is like, if you're showing uh, data that is numbers of people, like, don't draw little dots, right? Yeah. Draw people, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if you're going to describe people, like, draw people, people right. right? That's what I got. Well, yeah. access is short. That's the short of yeah. it. I mean, I, I think you know, there's something that is going on uh, at Axios, but also other news organizations with the different pathways to a different kind of story, to, like a different definition of what story mm -hmm. is, which is that, that visuals now are sort of parallel with mm -hmm. a traditional written story as, right. as how mm -hmm. a story is defined. And, you know, at, at Axios, the, the constraints of, mm -hmm. of being brief uh, have enabled that, and, and other organizations have found other pathways to that idea. I mean, I, I included a slide here of an old, now five years old project um, that Which is, is Snowfall, actually. Oh. Um, and, I, I, you know, these things seem like completely different, you know, like what Axios is doing and Snowfall, which is this huge behemoth of a project. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that, one thing that project did was to kind of elevate the status of visuals, you know, mm -hmm. e even though they were still a part of um, a written article, you know, there's this history of a kind of hierarchy, right, that you have in a thousand, a thousand word story and you have visuals that illustrate that story. And with Snowfall, we, we sort of, you know, mashed them together and made them equal and ed edited both in order to have a single story. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think um, editors uh, in the newsroom at the Times um, took note of the power of the visuals yeah. and, and how they were a part of elevating the story. And that also contributed to this idea um, that now in, in some ways is sort of take for granted mm -hmm. that like you can make visual stories. Visual right. stories can be, can be parallel with, with stories mm -hmm. that have, you know, a longer history. Right. A story can be a series of 10 photographs Mm -hmm. um, and you know, of course, there are, there are social media platforms that that have uh, come along that <clears throat> um, that have have forced some of these story forms right. even more. You look at like Instagram Stories, which is just you know a card-based story structure, right. images and words, and and it's a real way to deliver serious sure. news. Sure, mm -hmm. Jackie, teaching photojournalists how to tell stories in 2018, are you finding that the definition of what a story, I mean, here are kids coming to learn how to do storytelling from a complete, you know, a new generation of reading. Have you found that their conception of what a story is different than what it maybe used to be? Well, certainly the, you know, the digital native, um, this generation, um, I think is somewhat reflective of what we should acknowledge is uh, also the patterns that have changed with news consumers. I mean, some of this is driven by the fact that um, news consumers demand a visual in some mm -hmm. sense um, because it's their version of truth, right? right. They're so, um, we, you know, you can write a story and, um, you know, offer evidence and data, but there's something about having um, either a graphic illustration or a photograph or a video that some, somehow suggests that there's more truth right. uh, to whatever the news that is that you're delivering. And obviously, we know as producers of news, and hopefully you know this as consumers as well, that images and data and, you know, do and video can also be doctored. Um, but, but people don't assume that. They assume when they see, a, see an image. And so I think that the, the students that I'm teaching now um, probably reflect that trend. Yeah. So let's, let's segue into that. As, as you teach uh, students today, are visuals more important today than, than uh, are they more important now than they used to be, do you think? Well, I think that every journalism school program mm -hmm. in the country recognizes that we, um, yeah. you know, we don't even use the word multimedia journalism anymore because right. we assume that all journalism is multimedia. Right. Mm -hmm. right? We, don't, we don't make a distinction. We, we graduate students who want to mm -hmm. go into the profession of journalism mm -hmm. and we expect that we will teach them and they expect that they will learn how to do video and how to do photography. Um, it's an expectation. 
particularly in the, in the smaller uh, newsrooms, which are you know, facing a, a lot of uh, cutbacks, it, it's sort of assumed that you're, if you hire a reporter, that reporter also is going to need to do photography and video as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even here in Chicago at the larger news organizations, it's, there is the expectation that when you go out on assignments, you're going to, mm -hmm. at a minimum with your smartphone, mm -hmm. um, record video and, 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 and take photos. So I, I do think that um, you know, visuals are um, more important now, sure. and that's, um, you know, that's a reflection of the internet right. uh, and the availability of, of that content. So I, I just want to uh, touch on that, like, uh, point of, like, truth, right? Like, you know, like, are visuals more, like, uh, do they signify more truthful, I guess, um, you know, points? You know, one of the things that DataViz is uniquely positioned to do is that you can really show your work. Right. Yeah. I think often, like when you're doing like White House reporting, you know, you can say, you know, three people close to the matter, right? right? And you can't really say how you know it because you're going to burn sources, right? With DataViz, you know, you can make a recipe. You can say, I got it from here. I did right. this. Here's the data. Have fun, right? Yeah. And I think it's it's a good way for for readers to know that like you kind of know what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I'm showing this, and this is, is a summary of what we're talking about. But like, if you want to go back and you want to retrace our steps and question our methodology you have everything that you need to do that, yeah. right? It's, it's a yeah. way to engage readers um, to sort of, you know, have a uh, more direct uh, relationship with the news. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Steve, I'm going to skip over to you. Uh, given how, given this age that we live in, the social, the Twitter age, the Facebook age, how quickly thing, uh, graphic images spread, um, how does dealing with these sort of graphic images uh, what does that dealing with that do to a journalist? Do you think? So you, you're talking about traumatic. Yeah, images. like traumatic yeah. images, uh, whether it's a Parkland shooting right. or the thing, the the awful uh, incident in Toronto. Uh, right. Um, so uh, I actually had a conversation recently with um, a member of our video department uh, about this. Um, his name is Maliki Brown, and he does a kind of. He's part of a team that does a kind of. Uh, open source investigative work, um, and uh, he he used to work for this group called Storyful, um, which does um, social video verification. Just just to explain kind of what that is. Um, social video obviously is video that's emerging on different social platforms, and it can be very informative about different kinds of news events. Um, give us a lot of information about uh, a breaking story, like yeah. a mass shooting. Um, but, but lots of different kinds of right. stories. And that, that unit was, was devoted to, to examining a lot of that mm -hmm. uh, video and verifying like the authenticity of the source and where it came from and that it's real. Mm -hmm. um, and he mentioned that they had a, a counselor on their huh. staff because uh, a fair amount of that, of that imagery is, right. is so strong, so intense that if you're spending so much time wading through it uh, and for, for its very real informational value, mm -hmm. you know, there's, yeah. there's a real effect that that, that is having on sure. people who are not, you know, they're not photographers, you know, capturing combat, right. you know, obviously that, that, that's an obvious exposure to trauma. This, right. is, this is exposure that's happening inside a, a newsroom. It's, it's real. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackie, you've had some experience with this in your career, you were mentioning before, where, uh, y y what do you think about, uh, how do you think it affects journalists to work with uh, the kinds of images that f flow across the transom? Well, there's, there's been um, studies done. Um, it's called vicarious trauma, um, yeah. where you are experiencing a traumatic event by looking at it or mm -hmm. listening to it and somehow witnessing it um, you know, by watching video or looking at images. Um, and uh, and you know, it's been documented that, stu that journalists can have, it's OK. Uh, can have, Mass protests sorry. have broken out in Morocco after a video of a woman being raped by a gang of men oh, sorry, circulated on social oh. media. According to authorities, six teenage boys oh, were arrested on Monday, August it? 21st. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway, there, there is, I mean, I think we, we do recognize that there can be PTSD and, you know, yeah. there's an impact from, from looking at those images. Um, we were talking before. Uh, the panel about when I was in the Baghdad Bureau for the Washington Post, um, one of my jobs uh, for several months was to watch all of the beheading videos that were coming out. And, you know, and it, it's interesting because I'm sure it had an impact at the time. It was horrific stuff to see. Yeah. Um, but I had completely forgotten about it over time that I had done <laughs> that until I had to write a story 
um, when James Foley was executed in, in mm -hmm. Syria. Um, so I do think there, there is impact, and Storyful yeah. has, has recognized it. There are other news organizations that do recognize that there is an right. impact from you know, witnessing all of the, that, right. um, that violence. Yeah, and I know that uh, I worked in Denver for another year, a number of years, and there were a lot of work done in the newsrooms after Columbine. There were a lot of work done in the newsrooms after September 11th, and people who had to experience pretty horrific uh, coverage. Um, I want to switch gears uh, a little bit, and uh, Laz, I want you to imagine that I'm your uh, grizzled old editor, um, Roy Coesk, old uh, Journalist. I, I am the grizzled old You're, editor now. <laughs> and uh, what do you say to somebody who says that visuals, that data visualization, uh, the illustration, dumb down a story, that, they, that it limits its authority, okay, its so, seriousness? I mean, I think in my head I'll say you're so wrong. Um, <laughs> but, then, but then there are obviously concrete steps you can take. Um, so I, I'll, I'll preface by saying that you know, um, at, at Axios we started the company with like a visuals team in place. So it's very much a part of the DNA. Mm -hmm. um, and it is much easier to start something from scratch and do it well than to change an organization from the inside, right? Yeah. So luckily, I had no grizzled old editors. Um, right. But I did, uh, I, there is an editor that will remain nameless that said, well, why do we need a visuals team? We can just put a picture of a capital on everything, right? And it's like, well, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I, I think the way that you do it is I think you involve people, right? Like it, right. it's a show don't tell, right? Like you can't, you can tell people visuals are important, visuals are important, visuals are important, but as soon as like you make a graphic for their story and it goes viral, right. or as soon as you make an illustration uh, for their story and like it's much more well received or people read it because yeah. they were drawn in, you know, because of the illustration, that is, that is the best way to convert them. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and it really is just do your job very well, right? right? right. Um, you know, we, we did that. We made an illustration of Elizabeth Warren on a horse. Um, and now, <laughs> because she was sort of, you know, you know, I don't know, something. It made sense at the time. Um, and now every time that there's an illust illustration request, she's like, uh, put Fidel Castro on a horse. Uh, put Trump on a horse. Um, and I told him we can't put everything on a horse, man. I, I mean, I, um, I, I do think a part of this, um, both as a way of persuading grizzled editors, but also right. like, um, as a way of engaging with an audience is mm -hmm. to try to expand visual vocabulary, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why someone might think that, that, that visuals or a specific kind of data visualization is an oversimplification is because they're not aware of the sort of breadth of forms mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. shapes that this stuff yep. can take that, that can deliver mm -hmm. like really sophisticated insights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, uh, I included a slide of a piece that we did in 2010. Um, I'm not sure if we can. Which one is it? It's the map that shows uh, all of the arrows kind of moving in one oh, direction. Yeah. Let's see if we can get that. Yeah. No, next arrows. There you yeah. go. So, arrows. so the map on the left, um, yeah, we did it in 2010. Um, and the, that map is about, about shift in an election. So it's a midterm election two years after Obama was elected, and so the, the margin of victory in almost every congressional district in the, in the country, even if a Democrat won, it still shifted in terms of margin to the right, and, and so we could convey that as a visual impression of right. uh, you know, the whole country kind of moving in a, in a political direction. Um, and that's the kind of, um, you know, the kind of visualization that I think uh, opens minds a little right. bit. It sort of it, it expands uh, both grizzled editors' like notion right. of what visuals can be, but also our right. readers because it is sophisticated, but it's it's been edited to the point where it is right. it, you can immediately consume it. Right? right? Yeah. There's not right. a learning curve with this. You mm -hmm. kind of you see it. There's a visual impression. Mm -hmm. You know things are going this way, and then you can investigate to, to get a little more of the meaning out of it. And there's a lot of meaning in that. Yeah. Um, and I'm I you know I I I threw in um, that the little chart on the on the right, um, which is the same form essentially, but it's going the other direction, right? So right. this was, that, that little chart was a part of our live election results uh, for the special election yeah. in Pennsylvania a few weeks ago. So this form that we, we introduced to, you know, our colleagues who are grizzled, and, you know, there are right. fewer and fewer mm -hmm. of them. Right. Um, uh, and our readers in 2010 mm -hmm. is now something that we do routinely right 
in real time and can assume that readers kind of understand what we're doing because we have expanded that vocabulary. So, like I would imagine that if you went to an editor and you said, well, what I want to do is I want to do a, an arrow, but the arrow will be longer if the if the voters went one. You know, if you tried to explain yeah, it in words, that would they not would be say, persuasive. Right, yeah. you got to show them yeah, it. That's right. right. You mm -hmm. got to show them the thing, and then they say, holy smokes, it's yeah. shift. I mean, another thing, um, you know, if you sort of don't know like a lot about something, sometimes you can write around it. Yeah. You can't design around it, right? right? Like if you just don't know, if you do not have it nailed down, yeah. you're dead in the water, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, if you go back two slides, we did something on um, gun legislation, right? So, like, anecdotally, right, we know that, um, you know, there's not been a lot of uh, gun legislation, right? Like, we, we passed nothing, right? right? And we know that uh, Republicans don't want to pass gun control, Democrats mm -hmm. do, and it all fails, right? So this is something we know anecdotally, and we can probably right. say that anecdotally. Um, but you, you know, we, you know, if you go back and you do the work and you analyze mm -hmm. gun bills and you categorize them, and then you make this thing, right, then you can authoritatively say like here is the actual you know universe of gun bills and here's exactly what happened and now you know 100 percent right like there's no need for anecdote now you have the actual data yeah. and what is more authoritative than you being able to say a hundred failed gun bills right, right. instead right. of just there's been a lot <laughs> right and so you go and you find and how do you get that kind of information like how do you it's, it's all research. I mean, so this, uh, you know, thankfully, like, we've come a really long way as far as, like, how to make data more open and how to make yeah. it more available and easier to work with. This, uh, we pulled all this down from the Represent Project by ProPublica, which tracks sure. legislation in Congress and who sponsors it uh, and where it ended up. Did it even yeah. go to committee? Uh, we pulled all that down, and there's still, like, some legwork, right? Like, we have to right. figure out, like, okay, this bill is called... Uh, you know, the historic firearms, blah, 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 blah. Right. Like, is this a gun rights bill or is this a gun control bill, right? right. So that's still, there's still journalists, you know, working mm -hmm. to distill that data into something to make an insight. Right, I mean, yeah. that legwork and research, it's reporting. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. part, of, yeah. part of persuading, you know, grizzled editors mm -hmm. is, is, is showing them that you're, you're, you're journalists. You're you know? doing the real thing. And, and it's, it, you know, it's not always easy tracking yeah. down yeah. And, and cleaning and, and mm -hmm. presenting or, large sets of data. Or another, another example, um, uh, if, uh, if you go back, there was like the weird uh, speeches. It was Trump's speeches. One more. Oh, yeah. One more. Wait. One more. Oh, we're gonna, oh the video's going to mess up. Oh. There's the naked lady, too. <laughs> Jackie. This is a great that. panel. <laughs> um, yeah, that thing. So that was done uh, the night of the State of the Union, right, where mm -hmm. We got the transcript ahead of time. Yeah. We, did, we used a little bit of code to like split the sentences. So we and then we categorized each sentence live, right? Yeah. So I made people stay up yeah. and type into spreadsheets so we could make that thing for the morning, right? Uh -huh. And it's like, okay, instead of like reading 400 words, like, oh, Trump spoke about this, this, and that. Right. It's like, okay, just look at it and you're done, yeah. right? Like uh -huh. the speeches were different. Like, you know, we wrote a little, we had a little write-up afterwards, yeah. like, he focused a lot on, like, you know, uh, immigrants and crime this time right. around. It was, like, a really right. negative speech. Right. And it's like, that is a better delivery right. method. Right. So a human being listened to the speech and put di the different parts of Thankfully, the Thankfully, no listening. No, reading. Re reading this, read the speech and put the different parts into different categories. Yes. Yeah. So that was still, like, humans going, right. yeah. immigrants, oh, yeah. crime. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't know that that's well known, the amount of like brute force right. yes. sort of data yeah. input that, that, that is a part yeah. of assembling a, right. sort of a homegrown data set right. that, that can be really right. meaningful. Yeah. And that goes on all the time. It's yeoman's work, right? Like it's, yeah. you know, you, machine learning can go so far and AI can go so far. Right. But sometimes right. people have to sit down and suffer and make work. <laughs> suffer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> suffer for art. Um, let's see, I'm going to zoom past this stuff really quick. Oh, sorry. Jackie, you don't want to tell the Morocco story so we can put yeah, so showing this that is, slide? <laughs> um, so this is just an example where um, it's sort of the perfect storm of visuals uh, coming together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mor Morocco had tried, I was in Morocco uh, last fall on a grant from the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was looking at is why it had taken, it, for four or five years, um, advocates in Morocco had been trying to pass a basic law that would protect women against street harassment, which is a huge problem in Morocco. And the, the bill, the, the laws had been, or the proposed laws had been languishing. And then, uh, right at, at the start of the summer, there was a horrific uh, gang rape on a public bus in Casablanca that um, sparked all of this um, outrage on social media about it. But the thing that really was the turning point 
um, was that there was a video. And it wasn't taken by a journalist, it was taken by um, a citizen. And we see this as well in other parts of the world where um, you know, the, the, the citi citizens recording and documenting um, are, are, is, ve is very powerful. And so there was a video that went viral and then um, the cartoon that you saw was from a young um, Moroccan um, activist who um, published this cartoon on social media that got thousands and thousands of shares. And um, it was her political statement against, against the crime. Um, and here's the interesting part for me. So there was all of this outrage on social media and the, the video and, the, and her cartoon really spurred this, um, but nothing had changed. And then I came in old school and wrote a story for the Washington Post um, about it, and the law um, was, was actually passed uh, about a month and a half later. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if my article was, was, the, was the reason, but I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. it certainly was part of the conversation. Yeah. So you really had all of these things. Um, you know, it wasn't the video alone. It wasn't the cartoon alone. It wasn't the visual alone. Um, it wasn't the reporting alone, but it was a combination of all these things right, um, that really had the impact. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have this sort of mix of old and new and everything going on to make change happen in 2017, 2018. And what isn't new is the fact that I, you know, I spent my career at the Washington Post as a staff writer. Mm -hmm. um, what, what wasn't new that is that I knew that um, I needed a visual for the story. Right. And I was in Morocco without a staff photographer and I was gonna have to take the photo. Um, so, you know, I, I, the new part may be that, um, you know, I was doing my own photography, yeah. um, but, but not really as a foreign correspondent. I often had to do my own, yeah. um, my own visuals. Um, I wanted to show a little bit of some of the data storytelling we try to do at the Tribune. Uh, let's see, I'll get there in a second. So we got this great, in, in the course of reporting on uh, the, the big spike in homicides in Chicago a few years ago, we got this really interesting spreadsheet from the, the, the Chicago police that showed the, the number of homicides in our city uh, going back to 1957. And they sent it to us in this wonderfully rainbow Excel spreadsheet. Nice yellow. Um, and uh, of course, it wasn't even a spreadsheet. It was a photocopy of a spreadsheet. So you have to take, you know, you, it's a, you have to take that and, and do a bunch of magic to it to turn it into real data. But we hung, I hung on to this thing. We wrote the regular story. We, we made a chart with, with the story. But I hung on to it because I really wanted to tell the story of who, who, what is the story of homicide in Chicago? And if you go back to the 60s, what was happening? So we talked to a bunch of experts, and we, and we dug into 39,000 murders in Chicago and tried to dig, and we showed it. Here are the total numbers. Here's how it was, and here's how it was high in, in, this, in the 2000s and, uh, and spiked up in 2016. But we also dug into like what was going on in the city at that time. Was it racial turbulence during the late 60s? Was it uh, different types of gang conflicts in the 80s and 90s? And we went, dug into our uh, archives and showed examples of what are the different kinds of things. So one of the things we try to do is we might see data and it might be you know, just a plain old number, but we try to fill in some humanity and context around that. And that's uh, in the language of our storytelling. What Since we we're on crime in Chicago, yeah. why not? Yeah. Um, so there was a great, um, I think, Marshall piece, a Marshall Project yeah. piece that showed like time frames, right? Like, yeah. So there was a, there's a lot of coverage about crime in Chicago going up, right? right. But then that's if you look at a very narrow time frame. So right. this is a good way yes. to like, you know, the, the same way that you frame a tech story mm -hmm. by omitting things or adding things that are maybe out yep. of context, you can see, you can do that with trends and data, right? Yep. Like, where if you look at a narrow time frame, it's mm -hmm. up, but if you look right. at an, a, a wider one, it's right. actually down and probably like near like historic lows, right? right? Um, that's just a point there that like sometimes yeah. that context is something that's very very helpful. Right, the time scale is not there, but you can see the crime in Chicago was down from the early 2000s but it wasn't down when you compared it to the 80s or, or, yeah. or the 90s. Um, all right, uh, Jackie, let's, let's, uh, let's flip it a little bit. And uh, are, are news consumers today more literate or less literate about the news that they read? What do you, uh, what, what do you, know, what do you think about news consumers today? Well, I think that um, as our uh, reporting methods have become more sophisticated and our data vis visualization has become um, more important, um, I, I don't think that we as news organizations are necessarily doing um, you know, the same level of work to educate the people who are consuming our information. The New York Times does a great job of your explainers, your editors' explanations of how projects are done. Um, 
and you're an industry leader, but certainly there are a lot of news organizations that aren't doing similarly when they present um, a graphic, right. you know, about how what what the work was that went into um, how how the graphic came together, how it was reported. Um, you know, the fact that we have a believability problem um, mm. that people are so easily taken in and don't look. Um, every you know good graphic has a source at the bottom, but how many people look at source mm -hmm. and then go and and check the um, the website or that source to to verify whether yeah. it's a credible source and whether it's a partisan sor source. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I think we have become less literate mm -hmm. um, in in part because there's so many ways for us to get information, mm -hmm. and people don't distinguish between the sources of that information. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like, how do we move forward from that, right? Like, right. Do, do we become right. more transparent? Like, I mean, I right. know it's almost like basic practice now that whenever we make a chart, you not only list where you got your data, but you link to it. And if you modified mm -hmm. it in any way, you, you should say how you did it and then right. link to the final data that you used, right? Like, what are other ways to sort of push that transparency forward? Or like, I, I don't know, what's the best way to educate um, people into like how it was done or how to identify like things that are poorly reported? Right. Right, right, right. Well, let's let's talk about the future. What, Steve? What, uh, what does the future of news look like to you? Uh, well, I think one <laughs> the future of news. Uh, VR. I mean, one <laughs> slice of it probably is something that um, that others have already mentioned, which is um, sort of increasing use of visuals as evidence. You know, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that there's, that younger consumers demand, demand visuals, and they demand it as proof of the thing that you're writing about. And mm -hmm. it connects to the thing that we were just talking about, which is, how, you know, transparency, uh, showing our work. Mm -hmm. And there are different ways, there are different ways to, to use visuals as evidence. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not entirely new, but I imagine it will grow because of our growing access to different kinds of imagery, satellite imagery, you know, aerial photography, you know, CCTV, yeah. uh, camera footage, you know, there's just a uh, abundance of imagery, even on social platforms, that can be mined as evidence. And I think as we present that, we have to be, we have to be very deliberate about mm -hmm. sourcing and what it means. And we can do that, you know, through labeling and directly addressing you know the images that we're using uh, and annotation, mm -hmm. you know, of of images. Uh, but I do think that will be, you know, we'll see more of that. You know, at the times there have been, you know, you could sort of look at different individual projects that have really like registered with readers. And and I mentioned Maliki Brown a little while back, and his unit has produced a few that have really struck a chord with readers. Mm -hmm. There was um, a piece that they did about um, about the, the bodyguards who are working for the Turkish president and the sort of brawl that erupted mm -hmm. and their involvement. And, and that unit, <clears throat> as part of the video unit at the Times, really broke down every piece of, of video they were able to get their hands on. Some of it was, was social video to like very clearly show what had occurred, you know, how different actors like were engaged with that. And that kind of journalism, you know, which is, which is you know, a, Integrating visuals as as the evidence, as the proof, mm -hmm. um, I think it's 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 going to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? I'll paraphrase my our editor in chief, and he said everything's going to get smaller and faster, and we must adapt. Right? Like, <laughs> you know, one of the one of the big challenges uh, I think when making visuals is that uh, we all work on gigantic, beautiful Mac screens, right? Yeah. And all of our readers are on tiny, tiny phones, yeah. right? right? Or like. You know, you can't hover on a phone, especially me. I have huge fingers. Right. Right? So, like, it's it's yeah. th there's a there's a technical problem to solve there, where it's like, how do you tell big stories in a small space, right? right. Um, and how do you make sure people read it, right? Because right. I mean, you know, we we we're in the age where like, what's the average human attention span? Is it is it less than a goldfish now? Right. I think I think we're we're pre goldfish levels now, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> how do you tell people important information with right. that um, amount of attention to work with? And it's 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 an efficiency problem. But I, I think one thing that hasn't changed, though, really, is that um, you know consumers are still going to look at credibility of, of the source. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember what five, seven years ago, there was this big push that everything had to be video. Mm -hmm. um, every news organization Pivot. was getting into video, and it was just awful video. And as our analytics and our metrics, um, you know, analysis became more sophisticated, we realized, well, 
Is it viral because it had a view, or is it was it impactful because people lingered and they stayed and they watched? Mm. And so we've become better as as news producers about looking at you know how people are engaging with our content. Um, but really, I mean, it, it comes down to the credibility of the news organization, and I think that um, that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a graphic in a, in a credible from a credible news organization is going to have more impact than one than a meme that you find on Facebook that you do a little investigation and you feel you, you figure out that it's made up. Mm -hmm. So um, I just think that that part isn't going to isn't right, going to yeah. change. And, and I, to, oh, sorry, you go first. <laughs> well, I was going to return to your point about telling big stories on a small screen. Um, uh, you know, that, that has been a challenge um, at the times. You know, there was a, a kind of desktop era for visualization where you could go big with yep. um, really rich uh, interactive maps and other kinds of, of, of visualizations. And, and as our audience, uh, you know, spent more time on the phone and, and as you know, uh, more and more readers were consuming our stories on the phone, which is now more than half. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had to think about, that's a, right. that's a big design challenge. Right. And, and one project that, um, that we're working on now at the Times, um, that, that is a part of how we solve that. Um, there's, you know, so there's two paths. One is a sort of, sort of simplification. And uh, the other is, is, this, is, is, is the promise of this project, which is augmented reality. Um, where, <clears throat> so the Times has published a couple of uh, augmented reality projects where you can call up on your phone, sort of in your space, uh, an Olympic athlete, right? And they're hovering in your space. Uh, actually, yeah, this is a yeah. slide where you can sort of see mm -hmm. that th this was the fallback version of it. Um, uh, and we did another one around like you know David Bowie's outfits, and 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 we're pursuing you know harder news subjects with this. But there's, um, you know, th this is a pathway uh, towards you know a sort of scale on this small device when you're when you're when you're interacting with these subjects, you know, and you're sort of moving around and you're getting closer. It's a different kind of interaction. It's not right. it's not clicking and scrolling and right. swiping. You know, this is like you know physical action, and the there's a power to these, these objects um, being present in your space. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a kind of visceral, mm -hmm. you know, quality to that that, that yeah. gets you back to the bigness. And we haven't fully exploited what that means for visualization, right. but we're pursuing that. I, I think that's part of the pathway back yeah. to, right. you know, sort of going large, even on a small screen. Yeah. And, and to return to that point of video, like pivoting to video, right? Like, you know, everybody pivoted to video and it all failed. Um, so I think, I think, you know, where we're headed is like the full realization of different mediums, right? Like I think the internet has like slowly matured and it's like, oh, we can do GIFs now or now we can do Flash. Oh, wait, no more Flash, now D3, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think we're going to get to a point where like you got to, we're going to get better at choosing the right tool for the job, right? Like. The worst thing is seeing a chart that should have been a video or a photo that should have been a chart or any sort of combination of things. And not everything has to be a video. You should only use videos for things that video is uniquely good for, right? right. The same thing goes for like VR, AR, right? Like there are some things that, you know, you should not let the tool define the story, but let the story pick its own tool. Sure. Um, the, the, the best graphic is a bad graphic that doesn't get made. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. I remember that one. <laughs> Tweet it. All right, uh, so let's move to the uh, interactive portion of this afternoon's show. Uh, let's take some questions. Uh, I think there will be people to bring microphones around. Yeah, both Diane and I have microphones. We'll bounce from side to side. We'll start over here with you, sir. Hi, thank you all for being here. Uh, excellent talk, first of all. Um, I've got two questions I've been dying to ask you both, so I'll try to be brief. I hope we can get to both. Um, the first is, how do you think the rise of multimedia has changed what it means to practice a certain type of journalism? So for example, up until the recent past, a uh, purely investigative story or you know, reporting on a certain beat in the Times, it seems like it would have been sufficient to just have photos. And compare that to you know, a piece about mortgage-backed securities in ProPublica or you know, corporate tax law in New York books a wall of text up until very recently would have been sufficient and acceptable. But there seems to be this emergent middle ground now with data visualization, interactive simulations. That's the first question. I, I'm hoping you can speak to a, a little bit of that. 
The second is, I come from a professionally mathematical background, and we like to say there are um, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And while, you know, these data visualizations do lend an air of gravitas, and I certainly don't imagine that you guys have any nefarious intent, some of your less scrupulous colleagues could easily manipulate large data sets. What do you think are the ramifications of that? And thank you in advance. So the first, uh, I mean, your first question gets us back to a point that I was making about visuals as evidence. So this is already something that's happening. Um, you know, the Times including visuals uh, as part of an investigative report, um, as part of the presentation. Um, and, and even as part of how they conduct their investigation, there's a, there's a story that we ran a couple of months ago called, I think the headline was The Follower Factory. And it was mm -hmm. a story about people buying Twitter followers and a sort of marketplace for um, uh, Twitter followers and, and, you know, how much about that world that uh, ordinary consumers don't really understand. And part of the way that they did their investigation was to, to start to visualize data, to look at the patterns of when different numbers of followers, you know, decided to follow individuals uh, that we suspected of, of buying uh, followers. And, and in some cases you would have, you know, thousands signing up on the same day at the same moment, which suggested that they were being bought in bulk. And, and this was a tool that, you know, so Gabe Dance and, and Rich Harris and Mark Hansen, who's at Columbia but was working with the Times on this, created as a, as a reporting tool. Um, you know, this is, this is a sort of next step in computer-assisted reporting. Um, it's already happening. You know, we, we, we debated actually whether or not we were gonna publish a version of that visualization that they, that they were making use of to, to verify their reporting, and we, and we did. It's part of that project. Um, and, you know, that, that conversation now occurs uh, as a part of our um, investigative work, you know, a, a lot of it. You know, certainly there are plenty of traditional stories that the Times still publishes, and many of those are very fine stories. There's still, you know, like there's, there's great value in, in that work, but this is, this has entered, you know, this, the bloodstream in that, in, in that, you know, sort of branch of, of what the Times does uh, for real. Um, and I, I could maybe start off with the second question, which is kind of, kind of about safeguards in, mm -hmm. in how we deal with statistics. Um, look, it's a, it's a real issue, and uh, it's both an issue in terms of our, like, news organization's sort of internal understanding of data, but also uh, there's an issue of, of sort of reader literacy in what we're presenting, and, and do readers really understand uh, what we mean when we, when we do different things? And, um, those are a process, you know, I think part of the way you solve the internal, do we understand it internally, is, is you increase the level of expertise on the staff, you know, you bring specialists in, there, there are people with, um, you know, a background in statistics who are, are working on how we actually analyze uh, data. And I think we're growing in our awareness of, of the, you know, what, what, what we need to do in terms of presentation that we really can't take anything for granted. Um, you know, uh, we, have, we have learned some lessons about that and, um, you know, it's something that we will continue to, to learn about, but, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is, I think we've gotta really be pretty extreme in how much explanation we attach to um, our representations of data. Yeah. Uh, first question, uh, how has multimedia changed everything? Well, it's a market, right? Like, you know, uh, news is a market for your attention, right? We're all competing for your eyeballs, right? So if your competitor starts adding photos and videos and charts and you don't, you're going to lose. Uh, as simple as that. You know, like, you have to have better graphics, better photos, better video. Like, that's a simple, it's a saturated market. Um, and I don't know, that's about, I, that's the way I look at it. Um, second one, I guess, uh, you know, misusing statistics, um, I think, we have to be diligent into, you know, what the data set is, who it's from, and tell readers why that matters, right? Like, you know, it does matter if a poll was conducted internally by the DNC. Like, that's the poll for the DNC, and it's going to be maybe skewed, right? Um, so, what, you know, who, who, the data source, who the data source is, what we did with it, and what we can actually tell from these numbers and what we can't tell, right? Uh, you have to know and communicate what you don't know and why. 
Uh, and I think it's a transparency issue. The more that you can communicate then, the more you can say, like, hey, take this with a grain of salt, but you should glean these insights, um, I think is the better way to go. Yeah. I, I mean, just, just uh, on your first point, I, I don't, I mean, <clears throat> We, we've had a, um, a kind of goal at the times, um, well, not a kind of goal, a real goal to make the report more visual, you know? Mm -hmm. And to some degree, it's, it's connected to, to, to what Laz is saying about the competitive landscape, you know, that, that we, we want uh, more readers to become familiar with Times journalism, and we, we want them to, you know, understand the quality of it and to understand that we're, we're conveying a lot of it visually as, just as some of our competitors are. Uh, but I don't think that, it's not necessarily true that more is, is, is better, you know, that, that mm -hmm. more gets you to a higher quality report or makes you more competitive. Um, you know, everybody creating visuals as a part of, um, their stories as if everyone has the same sort of level of expertise mm -hmm. in, a, in a large newsroom is, is not necessarily the best pathway. Um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about the thing that you were talking about in journalism school where now there's an expectation that, that everyone has to start to have these skills. And I, my, my hope is that the expectation that we're establishing for that, we should establish the expectation that they, they understand it. But part of why you would want that understanding is or a kind of fluency and conversation about mm -hmm. what might make the best thing, about what, what, what decision we'll make about the, the best form for a story. Mm -hmm. Not that everyone is equal in their ability to like mm -hmm. shoot photography. I mean, photojournalists are, are great and, and, and photojournalism is the real expertise. That's real and the same thing is true with you know, video journalism and data visualization. You know, the conversation across these disciplines should be robust and, mm -hmm. and should be rooted in, in people's experience as part of the educational process that they sort of understand how things get made. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just turning everyone loose to make more, which is, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that that is um, uh, uh, what's being done in any specific case, but I, as a general philosophy is not, yeah. not necessarily the best pathway. Should we try another? We have a question over here. Yep. Hi, uh, this is a New York Times question, sure. um, which I ask as a devoted subscriber, so. Good to know. <laughs> One of those people who still reads the actual newspaper. Yeah. Um, one of the concerns I have is that there seems to be a conflating between how often something is looked at and how important <coughs> it is. The difference between the, the quality of and importance of the I news item itself and how many people saw it. And I have been very baffled by the New York Times devoting so much of page three to images of a story that was in the paper yesterday and saying how many people read that story. It seems, frankly, like a colossal selfie and waste of space. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I think your, the concern is, um, is really, really important. Um, you know, part of the reason why the New York Times uh, is good is because of the, the judgments that we're making about the relative importance of stories. And some of that has to do with reader interest, of course, but some of it has to do with, you know, experienced editors' judgments about whether or not those are things that, that readers really ought to see. And I don't, I don't think that the Times has gotten away from that. You know, that's still supreme, really, that, that the judgment about uh, value. Um, we are, of course, looking at what our audience is doing and looking at where their interest lies and are, you know, sort of entering into a kind of dialogue with them about, you know, um, the things that are popular with them, you know, so it does, it does affect in some ways how we look at some of those stories, but, you know, specifically that the, the thing that we're doing in print, I think, is a reflection of, a reflection back to our readers of what their interests are. It's not meant to suggest that that's how we're, how we're deciding what stories are, are important. Over here. This is also regarding the New York Times, as I'm a subscriber as well. I had a question about um, 
whether video, though, um, reduces what people are learning. And a perfect example is, I think there's a video on uh, the Times right now about uh, North Korea and how the guy has changed from being a total, you know, a dictator and now he's moving slowly, slowly to become a diplomat. It's like a three minute video. And it was an interesting video, but I have to tell you that I, I didn't read the story connected to it. And I realized, and I thought to myself after that and, and in coming here, did I do myself a disservice? And, and how does video affect you from that perspective of only getting the video and seeing these snapshots of him changing, but not reading why or what's behind it? Right, so, so there are different kinds of videos that get made and published by the Times, and some are meant to be a sort of succinct summary of a news event, um, and our hope is that readers uh, take those for what they are and absorb you know, the information that is there and choose, because it is available as part of our report, to, to dig into you know, other elements of what we have to say about that uh, news event. I mean, certainly there are, there are other videos that um, that answer every question, you know, that really encircle uh, a subject. Um, you know, two different sort of flavors. I mean, uh, one could be considered the equivalent of a written brief, and the Times has written briefs in the past, obviously, and does a morning briefing. You know, you could say that I, you know, you, you look at the item on North Korea in the morning briefing and it doesn't tell you everything about the story, but it's, that's not the intent of it. It is, it is meant to sort of bring you up to speed with some efficiency. Um, and some of our videos function that way. So that's, that's really an effort for us to, to meet different kinds of reader needs. In some cases, they want to quickly kind of understand top level elements of the story. In some cases, they want to dig more deeply and we, we do offer that, uh, that part of the you know, coverage. Time for one more. Well, this is a question for, uh, for all four of you. Um, since graphics are so powerful, have any of you ever uh, posted a graphic correction? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> oh, so you know, many oh, times. <laughs> <laughs> Could you give us examples of that? We're not proud of it. <laughs> but, I'm getting flashbacks. <laughs> I mean, I, look, the, the worst thing is when you have to republish the entire map, um, which is not, this is not a common thing, but, but it is, goes back to the transparency point, is that, you know, uh, you have to try to set things straight if, if there has been a mistake. Um, and sometimes if, uh, you know, depending on kind of the scale of the, of the mistake, you can, you can cover it with just a, a written correction to say that there was a yeah. label missing or whatever. But if it's a, a, a boundary or something that is really like visually, you wouldn't quite understand, you know, the issue without seeing it again. We, we, I, you know, I'm not recalling exactly when we last did this, because I know it was a long time ago that we did. Um, but we have done that, certainly. Yeah, I mean, like you, like, I mean I've, I've, I've done stupid things like mislabel islands, and those are, you're tired, like you make those mistakes. Like the worst one, when I was an editor, we made a map of ISIS, and uh, we got the map data, and instead of just like coloring the shapes by attributes, uh, we just made it all ISIS. And it made it through all of our processes. Yeah. And I guess we rewrote geopolitics for uh, our, <laughs> our morning readers. And that was a not good correction. That was a very bad one. I, mean, I think it's a, it's a fact of journalism life right You're now. You're going to mess up. Right. You're yeah, going to be human. Yeah, you you, we often hurry. We're trying to hurry along and meet deadlines and do the best job that we can in the time that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also important. We also build into our processes uh, lots of checking, right? Like we check ourselves and we have a, we go through a line of people who, who check our work and when we mess up, we try to cop to it. And if, yeah. you know, like when we make a mistake on a, on a digital graphic, we'll try to put it, we'll change it, right? We'll set the record state, but we'll also put a note at the bottom that says, hey, you know, we changed this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of that dialogue with, uh, you know, and sometimes we'll hear about a mistake, uh, somebody will tweet us out and they'll say, the oh, other yeah. day we got one that said, hey, you've got a person who was a victim of shooting in Chicago and you're saying that they're 327 years old. And I said, uh, you know, yeah. so I dug into all the data and I, I went back and checked the records with the police and it turns out they were 27 years old. That the person that when we typed in the data, we added that extra number, you know, so, mm -hmm. but when we goof up like that, which we do, you know, we just try to... Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that that is what is uniquely terrifying about print, 
Right. Um, <laughs> on, <laughs> online, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll fix it, and it's fine. Right. And print, it's like, no, it's just, it's just there forever, right. staring you in the face. Right. And I, I don't know if the three of you have noticed anecdotally what the studies show, which is that um, readers are, and viewers are more apt to find a mistake in a graphic, um, oh, yeah. which suggests a level of sophistication and careful attention that's being ta taken um, or being paid to a visual. Um, but but re oh, the study, people have studied this, and, and readers are very, very, um, they're very, very careful um, or in, about spotting these things, mm -hmm. these mistakes. Yeah. Good question, though. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Please, let's give a big round of applause for our presenters. Thank you all for attending. Please enjoy the rest of the festival.